the students who are the hardest to like are the ones who most need you to like them. My brother Darren was two years younger than me and my childhood playmate. He was a kind, sensitive, fun, funny child with a bad case of hyperactivity in the 1970s before medication like Ritalin was commonly available to parents. My mom did an amazing job of parenting him at home because somehow she just seemed to know all the right things to do for a child who struggled with impulsivity and hyperactivity. She was what Barbara Colarosa would call a, a backbone parent, strong and flexible, as opposed to a brick wall authoritarian or jellyfish permissive parent. She built us routines and structures to help him be successful. She gamified all of our routines, like getting ready for school. We would have races. We had charts and checklists to help us learn how to behave. We would gain or lose privileges based on how we were acting. I remember one meal, Darren and I were getting super silly and having a laughing attack. And by the time we lost sleepovers, sweets, friends, TV, we were crying with frustration knowing that we had done it to ourselves and yet still laughing uncontrollably. We had lots of things to help burn off his extra energy. Like for example, he would go out to the trampoline during dinner to burn off some steam and then he would come back to the table to eat. We had lots of activities to do to, to wear him out. We rode bikes, we went swimming regularly, we were in sports and clubs and tons of free time to play and have fun. We also had chores to teach us a work ethic. We ate hardly any processed food. Our sugar was severely limited. Anytime Darren had sugar, he would be um, walking on the furniture, he wouldn't walk on the ground. So my mom could always tell when he got into the suites because he would literally not be walking on the ground. The trouble for Darren was not at home, it was everywhere else. When he was two, he climbed up something high in the church nursery and knocked out his two front teeth. When he was a toddler, he was banned from visiting one of our neighbor's houses because he wrote on the walls. Sports weren't great. In uh, soccer, I remember his coach yelling at him to get in the game when he was in a mud puddle. Uh, in t-ball, I remember my mom being so mad because he got a home run, but the coach called him out because he threw the bat. And we were just always, we were so empathetic towards him and just always felt like he couldn't get a break. Once we were on a family vacation and we were renting horses and Darren's horse bucked him off and then went and bit him in the back. And I don't know if it was his nervous energy or if it was just bad luck. Sometimes Darren's bad luck was really his own poor choices. Once at a pool party, he was so mad because he didn't win the belly flop contest. And I remember him saying to me, I really hurt myself. And I said, why did you do it? And he said, well, they have a prize of a chocolate bar. It was just like so many impulsive things would get him into trouble or hurt him. It was like the neighbor called him Attila the Hun, the barbarian, which actually was an affectionate turn. They really, they liked him a lot and they often would invite him over for barbecues, but it was just like he was this ball of energy that was always coming up against things. My parents tried to build his self-esteem. They, um, they would read us books like Louis Pasteur, The Power of Believing in Yourself. They got him a dog because they heard that dogs can help build confidence. He named the dog Sparky and it was, it was good, but it just wasn't enough. School was the worst. I remember in grade one, he said that he didn't like school and I was worried for him because I knew that as he moved up in the grades, he was only going to have to be asked to sit for longer and longer periods without talking, and it was just impossible for him. In grade three, he had a privacy screen that he used so that he could focus and he liked it, but his teacher was super old school and um, really strict, and uh, she just wrote him all year. Later, she apologized to my mom for being so hard on him. His worst year in school was in grade six. He had an authoritarian teacher, and uh, one time the teacher held the kids back from going to recess, and Darren protested, it's not fair, and the teacher grabbed him under the arms, held him up, shook him, and said, it's not fair, it's not fair that I didn't win the lottery, it's not fair that my baby keeps me up at night, it's not fair that I have diabetes. And he did this in front of the whole class. 
Some of the other kids in the class told their parents and they complained to the principal and then the principal called my mom and said, there was an incident at the school, but it's been dealt with. Fortunately, that teacher moved to Australia halfway through the year on a teacher exchange. I remember being embarrassed for Canada that we were sending such a grumpy teacher to Australia and in return, we got this nice young teacher. When Darren was in grade five and I was in grade seven, our parents told us they were getting a divorce. It was clear that it was my dad's decision. I remember saying to my dad, can't you just buy a sports car and have a normal midlife crisis? But that didn't make any sense because he already had a sports car. Darren remembers pleading with him saying, we'll be good, which is just so sad. My teacher in grade seven said to me when she found out my parents were divorcing, um, you know it's not your fault. And I was like, yeah, I know. But I always appreciated the fact that she said that to me and I remembered that. And when my students later would tell me about their parents getting a divorce, I always made sure that I said to them, you know it's not your fault, just in case they didn't know. I don't know if anyone ever said that to Darren. I remember once uh, when my dad moved out, he was living on a houseboat and Darren called him to see if he could come stay with him for a few days. And um, my dad was like, no, it's not gonna work. And it was just so sad him holding his fishing rod, you know, hoping for to have a little time with his dad. I never took the divorce personally. I knew that it was about, you know, my dad wanting his freedom to pursue dating and stuff. But Darren knew he was a, tough kid to parent and I think he he really felt abandoned. So between the the constant trouble at school, the constant trouble with the sports teams and in the neighborhood and dad leaving, he was just really struggling with low self-esteem. And um, when he got to grade eight, I don't know what he was doing in class, but probably just not paying attention. And uh, they started to kind of take away some of the extra things. Like for example, he dropped out of French early. And I remember thinking that was sort of a shame because it meant that he wasn't going to be a candidate for university and I knew how smart he was. And then he ended up going to an alternate school, which was terrible because he ended up being with all the alternate kids. And he said to me when he kind of got in with the wrong crowd, well, they're the only kids who are nice to me. So soon he was smoking pot and drinking with those those kids and he became one of those kids. The alternate school didn't help him at all academically. They just sent him off to the library to do his work and they didn't even give him the right grade level work. He was in grade 10 and they were giving him grade nine work. He got into a lot of trouble. One time he was um, at a party, he had drank too much and some older kids were picking him up and throwing him over a fence and not even like birthday bump styles, just like picking him up and throwing him over the fence and not even bothering to catch him on the other side. One of my brother's friends called my mom and said, Darren's in danger, you need to come get him. So she came and got him and uh, he was saying like, don't tell anybody or don't call the police or whatever on the kids. But my mom didn't know what to do. So she called the police and they, they said, take him to emergency. So she did and he was treated for alcohol poisoning. He dropped out of school in I think grade 10, or 11, the alternate school. And he started doing some odd jobs. He left home when he was 18. If I could turn back time, I would pull him out of the alternate school, put him in some kind of outdoor education program, or send him off to um, a monastery to learn meditation and mindfulness on the top of a mountain in the middle of nowhere where he could be away from any bad influences, drugs and alcohol, but uh, at the time I was only 17 and all I knew how to do was just to be nice to him and um, maybe make him some food so he could put on weight. I went off to university and he started getting more and more into drugs and alcohol. He, he got into the hard stuff. I asked him once what kind of drugs he was using and he said he liked everything. For a long time it was crystal meth and then um, fentanyl. He lived wherever he could, people's friends' houses. Sometimes he was on the street. He lived in single occupancy residences, sometimes government housing. Off and on over the years, he would live with my mom. I made the decision to not have contact with him while he was using. My mom didn't. She always had contact with him no matter what state he was in. It, breaks my heart to think of the things she's seen over the years. My mom says his cycle was getting clean, getting a job, then getting some money, and then escalating his drug use again. 
once he had money, and then needing to go into detox, then go into rehab, and then get a job, but then he would make money, and then as soon as he had money, it was so tempting to go back to the drugs. He's been in detox, he told me, over 50 times, rehab dozens of times. The longest time that he was sober was nine months. My mom went to Naranon over the years. She didn't find it as helpful as her church community support groups. It's really hard to know how to balance out whether you're enabling somebody or not. For every book that says don't enable, there's another that says there's no recovery possible without the support from family. My mom took the approach that he needed to have somebody that he was in contact with, somebody healthy. When Darren was 48, he must have taken some tainted drugs because he had um, a really bad case of psychosis. He was hospitalized for it for over a month. When he got out of the hospital, my mom knew that he wasn't gonna survive if he went back on his own to live in the city, so she let him move in with her. She's basically been helping him on the road to recovery. They go for walks every day. She's trying to get him off sugar. He's off the street drugs now. He's just on the government prescribed pharmaceuticals, but they have side effects. And so she's working with the psychiatrists and with Darren to try to lower the doses, but they have to do it safely so he doesn't relapse. I visited him over the holidays three times, and it was the first time in quite a few years that I've seen him. I was super nervous to see him, and my mom said he was really anxious about seeing me too. It was actually really good. I expected him to look 100 years old because of all the abuse he's put his body through. And he was, other than not having his teeth, he looked great. He's still kind and funny, and we shared some laughs. But it was so sad to see him talk about how he has no options. And at this stage of life, you know, what does he have? Like, he's like, well, what should I do? And I said, well, help people, maybe, like volunteer to feel better about yourself, go for your walks, get healthy. It's been a tragic life of missed opportunity. Other than the drug abuse, there's really no reason why he couldn't have had a, an education, a career, got married, had children. He would have been a great father. The reason why I'm making this video is because there are a lot of teachers who are talking about quitting the profession. They're burned out. They feel disrespected. It's hard, but I never underestimate the difference I can make in a child's life. When I get those rambunctious little boys in my class, I always imagine my little brother before he became a drug addict. I'm just doing everything I can to help them believe in themselves, to know that I believe in them, to give them the strategies that they need to burn off their extra energy. I talk with parents about the pros and cons of medication. I tell them the story of my brother as a cautionary tale. Yes, there are risks with medication, but there are also risks with not giving children the tools to help them be successful. I want every child to know that I believe in them and hopefully help them build the resiliency so that they don't suffer the same tragic fate that my brother did. It's motivated me to be the kind of teacher that gives kids unconditional positive regard no matter what they do. I give them grace when they throw the bat. I give them compassion when they get bucked off the horse. I've channeled my guilt for all the years that I didn't have contact with my brother selfishly because it was too hard for me to watch. I've channeled that into the service that I've provided for my students. I know that it's made a big difference in a lot of kids' lives. If you're a teacher, please keep going because kids need you. And if you're a parent of a child who's struggling, don't give up. My mom's 75 years old and she's still actively parenting. However much work it is when they're young, it's worth it. You don't wanna be doing it for 50 years, so do what you can when they're young to set them off on the right track. And Darren's story is not over. He's amazingly resilient. I, I, I really hope that I can do a part two of this video and say more about his recovery and it's not a lost cause and that even at 48, there's still a future for him.